Alrighty, hello everyone. So Eric, here's my answer for you. David Nolan's test. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about RxJava, um, reactive extensions for a, uh, async programming. I ended up spending the last a good chunk of the last two years of my life um, being a primary contributor to porting this from C Sharp to Java. And what it's all about is if you were to put on a grid the different ways of dealing with data, so I spent the first 10, 15 years of my programming life predominantly on the top, synchronous, uh, getting data in intervals, and then playing with futures. And uh, learning about the, the Rx approach to how to deal with async exposed me to this, this uh, bottom quadrant, which is how do you deal with asynchronous streams of data and where you're dealing with multiple values. So unlike a future where you get back the one value and you're done, how do you deal with lots of data coming back and potentially infinite uh, amounts of data coming back? Also, we, uh, the observable is lazy in nature uh, rather than being eager like a future. And so the observable, we, when we discovered it, we saw a lot of benefits to it, but it was only in C Sharp at the time, so we decided to port it. So that was about two years ago. Here's a few examples of what it looks like to use uh, Rx, and then I'll get into some I'm going to walk you through some pretty non-trivial, but uh, basically explanatory examples of how we use this at Netflix and why we adopted it and, and how it's affected what we do and where we're kind of going with it and how it's affected and changed our way of thinking about the applications we write. So the most basic hello world looks something like this in Java 8. You emit one value and you complete the thing. This makes it so that it's behaving very similarly to how a future would be. It's a scalar in nature, one value it completes. The only difference being is that this is lazy. You can subscribe to it as many times as you want. Each time you subscribe to it, you'll get a value out of it. A little bit different now, I can do multi-value response. So each time I subscribe to this, I'll get three values out of it. This is still synchronous though, and so there's, there's absolutely no concurrency going on when this runs. So all concurrency is, uh, uh, you are opting into it, you always have the ability to control it with schedulers. So the, the reason why there's the FRP-like thing on Rx, Rx is not functional reactive programming, despite some things I said two years ago, when uh, if you've ever looked at some of the earlier stuff I've said. And the reason why is because Rx does not uh, have continuous time, which is uh, required by Connell Elliott uh, to, to, meet, <laughs> to meet that. Um, and whereas in Rx, it is purely talking about discrete events and virtual time. So virtual meaning that you can, it's all abstracted away so that you can inject, uh, it's parameterized, you inject these things called schedulers, and you can uh, move your data wherever you want it to be, different thread pools, actors, whatever, or you can even virtualize it and take control of the concept of time, which we use for like testing. So when you're doing unit testing, you want to test things that are concurrent, like a tick at certain times, you can t take control of that and you can execute like 60 seconds of things in you know, a few clock cycles because you virtualize away what the idea of system dot, you know, time in milliseconds is right now. So error handling, error handling in async is really bad if you do it like you write imperative code. If you just start throwing exceptions everywhere, that works very poorly in an async system. So you have no idea what thread you're gonna be on. This is the most trivial way of showing how you funnel errors down the pipeline. So you on-error it, and errors are first-class citizens, and they all flow down the pipe, just like a, a, a data event would. You also see here, this is one of the first examples where I'm showing how uh, the, the schedulers are virtualized. We subscribe on, in this place, we are saying, when this work is executed, I want you to do it off on the I.O. thread pool, and so it is actually going to move that work off and make this asynchronous when it runs. This one is showing how uh, to support unsubscription. So everything in observable is, can be canceled. And so it has bi-directional communication so that uh, the data is flowing down, but you can also unsubscribe up. And this is how all resource management is handled in, in Rx. And so that you have an entire lazy sequence when it's subscribed, any resources that it creates in the process, it, the, the contract is that 
uh, either the subscriber can cancel it or when a terminal event occurs, on air or on complete, that unsubscribe the event will propagate to the entire uh, sequence back up and allow all uh, resources to be cleaned. This one's a little bit more complicated, and most people will not have to do this, but I want to show it because this is um, this is how reactive what uh, Eric Meyer, the inventor of RX, has coined as reactive pullback pressure. If any of you are familiar with the reactive streams project, this is very similar in nature. We have wor um, we have worked with the reactive streams pro uh, team, uh, Scala and other folks, uh, in contributing to the spec. And so this demonstrates how you can end up with a bidirectional push-pull uh, relationship in a sequence. And the way that that works, if you just want to think of it as like a seesaw, if the consumer is capable of keeping up with the data that's being pushed at it, it will stay as a purely push-based system. If at any time, though, the consumer becomes slow, uh, slower than the production, then the bounded queues in any of the operators that, that need queuing will fill up and it will then move into a pull model and it starts to then pull in batches from the producer and so this allows it to, uh, this allows us to uh, use only bounded queues and all the operators like merge and zip in those places rather than unbounded and so the system can naturally propagate back pressure up the system generally you're going to want to just use that instead so if you have some a cold data source that can be represented as, inter, as an interval, this does all of the, the reactive pullback pressure behind the scenes and all the performance optimization and things like that. If you have a hot stream, that's a whole different talk <laughs> about that topic. So at Netflix, we do movies and all that kind of stuff, TV shows, and we discovered RX when we were dealing with web services that looked like this and they were way too chatty. And uh, this came from a very typical RESTful APIs and they had all been done with, you know, you're supposed to make really uh, fine grain, granular, resource-oriented APIs. They really work poorly when you try and actually get them to perform well, and then you end up in just really bad RPC over the WAN, and it was bad. And so we wanted our stuff to look more like this, where you had a very, uh, we call them experience-oriented APIs, where each device is able to basically custom create a web service that is targeted at whatever device and user experience they're trying to do. And so it does exactly the work it needs to do, requests exactly the data they want, and returns exactly what they're looking for. And so we kind of turned our model on its head and allow all of our different device teams to create their own web services that run on top of our platform. But what that meant is that we were taking all the inherent concurrency that we had through all the network calls, and we were shoving it all off onto the server, and now we actually had to reason about it. Uh, and what this meant for us is that, uh, another thing this meant for us is that we wanted to allow 50 to 100 different engineers in our company to all be running this, and not uh, all of them wanted, we didn't want anyone dealing with the primitives of concurrency in a JVM. If they were having to deal with like semaphores and locks and like concurrent data structures and stuff, we were, that was just not something we were okay with. So we needed an abstraction over that. And this is when we started the research project. And this is the type of code, I'm going to use this as an example to walk through. It's a big wall of text, I'm going to walk you through it. This is uh, basically that picture. That picture right here is what this code is doing. So I'm going to walk you through this so you understand why we ended up going this route. So if we start, when we get a request, this is a request response loop. So this is all one method. And what this method will do when you execute it is it will output a server sent event stream that is feeding back to video metadata. So if you ever have used Netflix or a similar service and you get that grid of movies, and that grid of movies is populated with the artwork and the titles and all the different metadata about them, this code will do that. This would render back a grid of, let's say, a couple hundred movies and all the metadata you need to show. The first thing that you ever do when you come in is you've got a user ID. That's typically uh, how you start it all. You say, I've got this user ID. And so right here, I want to kick that off, and everything else in, my, in this method depends on that. I flat map over that, and what flat map is doing is it's basically saying, when I eventually get this response back, I want to perform a function on it that's going to transform it, but that function I'm going to do is asynchronous as well. And so it could return multiple values. And so you can see that it's different than a map function, that instead of it returning just going from T to R, it's going from T to observable of R. So it's saying, 
Inside this function, I'm going to be doing other work that is also asynchronous. And when you merge it back in, I just want you to flatten it out. Um, so that's what the flatten is all about. It's really just a map function that's being merged. And so when I flat map over it, or think of it as and then, then this, I get a user out of it. And now I can do all the other work that I really want to be doing. So this has called me back when it's got that user object over the network. And I want to kick off this block of code and this block of code in parallel. There's absolutely no relationship between these two. So I'm going to go get all the catalog data in the top block and get some social data in the bottom one. So in that first one, we say, go off and get that personalized uh, catalog. And again, flat map over it. And if any of you have, uh, work in a language with like async await or four <coughs> comprehensions and those types of things, the places where I'm using flat map here, you're going to see I've got some nested ones. You'd be able to do nested for loops um, in languages that support that kind of thing. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, Get that catalog back, and then for each list in there, because there can be many of them, I then want to say for each of the videos in there, <coughs> so now I'm for each list, so let's say I've got 10 lists, and for each video, let's say that there's 100 videos in each list. I get the video out of it, and then there's three things I need to go get. So I want to go, I'm going to kick off those three things, I'm going to get, uh, actually, it's all lazy, so I'm not kicking anything off. I'm declaring these three things I need to go get. And then I want to zip them together because I need to, I can't return the video metadata until I get these three things. What zip is doing is it's saying, wait until I receive all the value, uh, a value from each of these things, and then execute this function that will allow me to combine them in some way. And so my combination function here is saying, uh, take those three things plus the video object within, who's within scope and go do this thing and put them into a map. And so in this case, I'm just turning it into a, a map of string object. And then I've now got the social and the catalog data, and I wanted to merge them together. This is like merge that you've seen in, in the earlier talks. And this, this just allows the race to happen. Merge is not trying to um, govern either of them. The only thing that is gov governed about it is it does have the bounded uh, buffers inside, so it does back pressure and all that stuff. So, looks like that when you merge. Whatever's coming in on the multiple streams, just puts them in so that it's uh, serialized and thread safe and puts it out into a single stream. We flat map over all of this and then all of that up at the top there, we're gonna get hundreds of events emitted out of this. Because if I, let's say I've got those 10 times 100 movies, I get, I get an event per movie and then I get also at least one event for the social data. I don't want to wait for everything to be done before I start rendering back to the UI, so I'm going to emit this out as a server sent event stream. So as the data comes back, however fast it comes back, I'm writing down to the wire and writing out these server sent events, and then the UI can respond to them as they come in. All of that led us to the decision, that kind of a use case led us to the decision to stop doing these blocking APIs on our service layer and move to observable APIs. These observable APIs basically force our entire service layer that our web services are built on top of to be async and non-blocking and allows uh, code to be declarative and compositional like that. Flipping back to that code, there's at least six different places in here where we, where we potentially are doing network calls and there's two places where there's a vector response. There's n number of values coming back. Potentially what that means is for those three calls, three, four, and five that are within that, um, nest, those nested loops, I could potentially in a naive implementation on the back end be doing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of network calls. In fact, you could actually easily get up to like 3,000 plus network calls here if you did this really naively. So this brings me to one of the next reasons why we were really interested in Rx. It's not opinionated about where concurrency comes from and how it arrives at, uh, in the system. In a lot of systems, like uh, the use of futures, they're tied intrinsically to thread pools. And you execute the thing, and it's always off on that thread pool. An observable is just an interface and a, with semantics around it, and so the, the production of the data can happen however we so desire. So one way is you can actually do the work synchronously on the thread, no concurrency at all. And in fact, that's actually what we do on one of these in, in our production environment. 
we have chosen to optimize for the particular uh, metadata request that it always comes from an in-memory cache. But it, uh, the important part there is that the users still consume it the same way. They don't have to care whether it's coming from in-memory or the network. We want them to be consuming it the same way. It allows the programming model to work, but it also keeps it free for us to choose. Maybe sometimes we go to the network. Maybe it's an LRU cache where the top 80% are sitting in memory, but the 20% you know, long tail is over a network. It keeps it open for us to do that. You can also do it, do it on a separate thread, on multiple threads, on actors. You could do it on an uh, event loop using NIO. And in this particular code, that's actually what we do with all these. These are all running on many event loops under the covers when they do their network calls. Um, or like what happens often on Android devices, it's more like this, that you would subscribe on, you put your work in a background thread, and you say, but the callback, I want it to be on this. So you say, subscribe on some IO thread in the background to do my network, and then observe on my main UI thread so I can render to the screen. And so it allows you to uh, parameterize the concurrency and, and tell exactly which parts you want where. The other big thing that we liked about it is it decouples the consumption from the production. And because it's not opinionated and because the interface allows us to separate the two, it means that, um, like in this example, the consumer treats it as if it's async and, and assumes that there's a potential cost in, in doing this call but they compose it in such a way that it just reacts to wherever the data comes from, but it keeps it free for the, the people who are actually implementing the production of that data to make all those different choices. And so we really like that it decouples the, the two. Now, if you're the same team, if you're just like one developer doing all the code, that may not be so important. In our environment where we have lots of different teams and people who very rarely actually interact day to day, it's a big deal for us to be able to decouple those different layers of our code base. These two uh, are a little bit more interesting. I mentioned earlier that you could end up naively with thousands of calls on this. Well, we still want to have the simple user interface of treat it as if you're actually fetching this. Behind the scenes, though, we're actually doing uh, automated batching or request collapsing. Because it's an async API, as it goes through the list in those videos, it's firing, it's going through them. Uh, and remember, it's, uh, it's lazy in the processing of those. And so as it crunches through potentially thousands of these videos behind the scenes, we can then capture them all at these you know, millisecond level and then window them into one or five or 10 millisecond batches and then put them out over the network on our own time. And so in reality, when we run this in production, this is actually only five network calls. And so this whole thing, potentially with hundreds or thousands of video items, works out to the you know, five. It's a little bit non-deterministic. It may end up being six or seven, because that's, we allow that because of how the batching works. And so this all of a sudden is now an API that's easy to consume, but also because we've decoupled production and consumption, how they, de how they declare their intent works regardless of how we're choosing to produce and fetch the data on the back end. And so we also like the fact that uh, it's not opaque. It's very transparent that any time I'm dealing with an API that returns an observable type, there is a potential cost. Typically, that means that there is I.O. involved or the potential for I.O., and it should be treated as such. And the API, through the use of operators like flat map and map and filter and take and all those things, basically it is enforcing a, a, a pattern of consumption that uses resources well, is not blocking uh, or tying up threads, and allows patterns like that clap, the, the automated collapsing, that is actually very, very hard to get right if you're allowing the consumer to arbitrarily block and park threads. Because then they can get into a for loop, and then I saw this once in production, where it was a for loop on a future, and they were doing a future.git because they needed to dereference the value, and that particular thing was trying to do batching behind the scenes. So it was actually, instead of it quickly going through, it was waiting for five milliseconds on each time for the window to fire, and then it would fire a, window, a batch with one item in it. And so it took like a for loop with 100 items in it and turned it into this incredibly lengthy thing. 
And so when you allow someone to block, it removes all these capabilities that the, that the uh, producer can do if they instead are behind APIs such as this. And also, that then allows implementations to differ over time. So in our production environment today, these work like this. We've, we still have a lot of blocking network calls, of, uh, just legacy of, uh, of our code base. We're working on doing changing like this, but the APIs won't change at all. None of the consumers will have to care. They'll just one day all of a sudden change to that one's on an event loop now rather than a thread pool. And this one, some of them now are going over the network instead of being in memory or, or whatever it is. And so the fact that retrieval, transformation, and combination of data are all done in the same declarative manner is a really big win for us. And it allows the, the teams creating the web services to all become really good and skilled at declaring their intent. And then we can manipulate and optimize what happens when that runs in all kinds of different ways. So we've had a lot of success at the top layer where we put in these observable APIs and this reactive programming model. And the top layer is basically all, where all of our web service code is, all the endpoints that serve all the Netflix traffic. Uh, unless you are on a really ancient device running on our most legacy of legacy systems, um, all Netflix traffic, if, you're, if you use Netflix, goes through uh, reactive web services like this. The bottom half, though, uh, we, we left that all is thread pools and blocking I.O. and uh, typical Java type code, very imperative. And part of that was just because it, we weren't about to rewrite the entire code base just on an experiment. Secondly, it takes a long time to rewrite an app of that size. And third, it was just prudent to not try and change the entire thing all at once. So we leveraged the fact that the observables um, decouple that. And so we, lever we put thread pools uh, wherever we needed them to pretend that it was naturally async. So the top layer sees everything as async. And then under the, underneath, we're controlling that all with thread pools. But with the success in the top half of our app, we started to wonder, can we do better? And so we started experimenting with uh, Netty, like everyone uh, that does Java <laughs> and servers. And <laughs> we wanted to combine the two. Um, we came to the same conclusion that, ne that Netty is an amazing engineering project. Its APIs leave some things to be desired. There, it, it's very low level. It is very low level. So we, we started putting abstractions on top of that to make it a little bit more sane for us. And along the way, because um, try Replacing a, network st a networking stack is a non-trivial event, like something in a big company like us. Really, it's like a once a decade type of, a, a type of event. So we've, we've done quite a, a lot of work and thinking on this. One of them is we, we put together this uh, little project where we um, created some, uh, some benchmarks that are representative of the type of work we do. This particular one takes in a request, kicks off two things in parallel, and then as they respond, it does more work and then combines it all together. So it does five network calls. Total latency should be around 150 to 155 milliseconds. And it's all JSON and all that stuff. When we started doing benchmarking, and we benchmarking is like the best way to get yourself like you know, in a world of hurt, saying wrong things and like things that can be um, proven wrong. And so thankfully, we had one of the industry experts in this game, Brendan Gregg. Um, who he's like seriously he's written a book that thick on Linux system performance, and so we spent several weeks with him on this. And uh, here's an interesting tidbit. I'm going to show you how the, the difference is about two times. When we first started comparing Tomcat blocking what we've been most of our production environment still runs in that to the the Netty based one, it was a ten times difference in performance, like ten times throughput. And it's like surely that cannot possibly be. What we found, just this is anecdotal, is that on an event loop based system, it's really hard not to get the optimal performance. On the thread based model, it is ridiculously hard to optimize the system. It, like, it's, it took an expert two weeks, and, and that's like someone who's looking at like the, system, like the system level metrics to get everything tuned right to the point where we could actually see the optimal performance of it. For me, just purely at a practical level, that was very eye-opening after me working 10 plus years on that kind of a stack as to 
uh, how much easier it had been to achieve optimal performance on this different reactive event-based uh, event model. So let's dig into the details of this. On 80th percentile and down, so this is where, you know, let's assume the happy path. Things are pretty close, but you'll already start to see that there's a pretty big difference. So orange and yellow are, are RX and Eddy implementations. So Netty with a thin coating of the reactive extension stuff on top of it. And green and blue are Tomcat. The green one is Tomcat doing, uh, having 400 clients hit it. And the, the orange is Netty having 400. Blue is Tomcat with 200. So you can start to see right here already that Tomcat received with 200 clients pounding it. And you can see the request per second that it averaged uh, in the legend along the top there. That in the happy state, we're about a two times difference in throughput while achieving similar latencies. As we start to move into the 90th and 95th percentiles is where it really starts to show the difference in what happens. And 99th percentiles are incredibly important because that's basically what your users are going to experience, especially if you're in a service-oriented architecture where you're composing network calls. If, you're, if, you, if a user request comes in and then they do 10 network calls to get everything, that means that they're going to get the 99th percentile one out of every 10 times. And if you have a more complicated web, like I actually saw a call graph recently for uh, a pretty major endpoint, and it hits like 50 different, does like 50 plus network calls by the time it's done and everything. And so you're experiencing 99th percentile there, like every second request from the user's perspective. And so 99th percentile is important. And this is also what kills queuing in systems is 99th percentile. And so right here we, oh, I don't want to drop my laptop off. There we go. Um, the Tomcat running at 400, we would never allow that kind of throughput. Uh, the latency is just horrible. So if you take it down to the 200, so it's half the throughput of the Netty one, the 99th is what it starts to jump, and you can start to see the difference of what the max percentiles are doing. Those max percentiles are what kill systems at scale. And so you can see now that it's uh, almost triple the latency that we're starting to see there as the, as the system starts to thrash itself. We dig in a little bit closer, you can start to see those numbers. And, and what jumps out is how the, the threaded model, uh, so this is when you've got hundreds and hundreds of threads on, like a, we were using small machines just so we could push them. So this is a four core machine and with hundreds of threads is what you would need to be putting this throughput through on it. And so it starts to spike, spike. And so this brings up another point that we found interesting. Um, and we haven't, been, we haven't yet proven this in our biggest production systems, but the, the, the evidence thus far is that not only is it a benefit for the programming model and the, the resource efficiency, but we're also very interested in the resilience characteristics. The fact that as we push our machines to the, to the limit, like with thundering herds and those things, it handles it far better because instead of every request tying up system resources and then causing the, the system schedulers to get put under load, is nothing more than the expense of uh, a file descriptor and a queue, like an object sitting in a queue somewhere, a callback reference. So there's going to be a lot more from us um, as we finish our testing. We're rolling out either this week or next week uh, the first round of our major production testing on this stuff. And this is one of those areas where the, ex the success in using the reactive programming model is starting to push itself deeper and deeper into our stack is we're looking at replacing our entire networking stack across the company based on this model. One of the, one of the other areas, uh, as I wrap up, is, uh, is stream processing itself. And so we've been, we've been using streams, uh, data streams, on the operational side uh, for the last couple of years, but we've been implementing them all in a very imperative manner. All the typical things you would expect doing that in Java, concurrent data structures and locking and trying to like balancing between the um, blocking synchronization and non-blocking synchronization and very difficult code to reason through to power dashboards such as this, which is aggregating streams of data from thousands of machines. This one I think is only, it's about 300, uh, this particular example. And so we've had systems like this running for years, 24-7 uh, aggregating data. 
but we want to get more advanced with this. We're building uh, operational systems like this that will be constantly monitoring our fleet of servers and doing anomaly detection on them and things like that. And we realized that our, our existing approach just wasn't going to scale and it was too difficult to reason through. And so, the, again, the, the reactive model, um, just, it fits. And so the stream processing here, and this is stream processing in the true sense of streams. They're infinite streams of data, they never end. And so Java 8 streams actually can't do this. Uh, Java 8 streams are, are finite and synchronous, funny enough. Um, despite their, their name, they work on intervals. And uh, whereas this is all about pushing the data at you as it's coming in and potentially infinite uh, streams of data. I'm not going to walk through all this code, but this is, this is the, the, the heart of the, the merge logic that takes a stream per server, so it has a connection to each server in a cluster, and then within each of those streams there's hundreds of different metrics that you're interested in, and then it pivots that data sideways so that you're actually going to get each metric aggregated and summed so that then you end up with a stream out the bottom that is each metric with the sum of all the instances of data. And it sounds really straightforward to say it until you actually try and write that code. And um, especially, yeah. So we're able to leverage things like group by, this pattern of buffer and then mapping over it. This is actually really powerful on a stream to do so, something as trivial as on a stream of data, I want the delta coming out. And so as you buffer this thing, stepping along one at a time, it, it just keeps giving you a list of two items with the current and the previous, current and the previous, and then it allows you to map over it and uh, calculate the delta, and then it emits the, de the delta. And then as I merge all that data back in, because I'm in a flat map, uh, I can scan or fold over it. And as I fold over this now, I'm just taking the sum of, I'm summing the deltas from all the hundreds of servers that I'm pulling in, and I'm doing that in, instead of the, the naive approach would just be to every time I receive a value from some machine that I just loop around everything and sum it up. But think that through and you'll realize that that's a really expensive proposition to do. And so, again, this concept of doing the scan over all these hundreds of streams or thousands of streams coming in, and this starts to make the code far easier to reason through. And it took seriously like dozens and dozens of, of Java classes and condense it down to a far smaller subset that's much easier to reason about. We have found um, the, the reactive programming model to be very successful for us at, at Netflix. I haven't even talked about the UI side, um, time, and that's not my area of expertise. Almost, uh, I'd say over 80% of our UIs, give or take, are all based on RxJS, the JavaScript implementation. Uh, basically, all of our popular platforms that use an HTML-based, JavaScript-based UI, which is most of them, uh, they use RxJS, and it's a very functional style that they've adopted. There's some phenomenal talks out there by a colleague of mine named Jafar Hussain, who was the guy who introduced me to Rx a couple years ago. And so we use Rx both server-side and client-side. And uh, one of the next things we're very interested in doing is uh, right now we still do request response between the devices and our servers. We're very interested in looking at web sockets, and we literally just stream data back and forth. Um, there's some interesting challenges to getting that to work at our scale um, that we're working on. Um, we just, the, the website there at the bottom is just like launching, it's getting off the ground. Rx Java just in the last couple of weeks split out into like a dozen projects. Um, so that Rx Scala, Rx Groovy, Rx Closure, they all become top level projects of their own. They're all going to start having their own life cycle and, and release releases. And uh, Rx Java is at 1.0 release candidate now. There's a few things that still need to be, uh, that I'm not quite comfortable with yet calling it final, but it's pretty dang close. We've been using it in production for two years ourselves, but there's a few things that I just want to make sure are done before we call it final. Otherwise, there's more information that can be found uh, in some of these older posts and then uh, a lot more on the website and the wiki itself of the different projects, including RxJS you can go take a look at. Thank you for having me out. Take some questions. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, Art, do you have questions for Ben? I know it's really late. You probably want to go home. Oh, yes, but, but there is beer. Um, and before I do that, uh,
understood. So, so if there are no other questions for Ben, I would like to thank him and Daniel and Eric for speaking today and for all of you for coming. Um, if you don't mind.